Welcome to Daily Armor. Today we're going to be back in the book of Hebrews chapter number 11 and we're going to be looking at verses 11 through 19. Um, just to give you a little bit of a heads up, um, if you use your Bible to listen to these, these devotions, have it ready to do some flipping. Um, Lord willing, if I get to use everything that the Lord has um, given me in my notes to use, we are going to be in the Old Testament. We're going to be in the New Testament. We're going to be flipping back and forth. Um, I really was kind of pondering on those uh, about the things that are impossible and really pondering on a lot about um, faith and what that is. And as I was thinking about faith I, and looking at the Hebrews 11 is the faith chapter. This is also what I just got done teaching um, as for the youth group on Wednesday nights. We went through the faith chapter looking at the different um, the different circumstances, the different scenarios, the different um, rendition, who all is in the, the chapter of faith. If you look back um, at verse number four, it says by faith Abel. So if Abel was the first lesson that we would have had um, after that initi initial lesson. And then we went all the way through dealing every Wednesday night with a different person that's mentioned here in the chapter of faith. And as we ended the devotion yesterday, I just really felt incomplete. I felt like I kind of left it um, kind of hanging, but yet that was all that I, you know, that, that was, it was kind of where, how it ended. So today is going to be kind of a continuation of that. Um, and going to, I want us to, I want us to look at the faith of Sarah and the faith of Abraham. And I want us to look at it and, and see how that it might would apply to my life and to your life. Um, I've got some things that I've been in prayer about for quite some time. Um, some things that have um, has over the years and over the, especially over the last, I would say probably over the last, I don't know, maybe six months, maybe nine months, um, that has really, really um, broken my heart. Um, some things that I'm praying about, some things that um, uh, just, and, and, it was, and it's got to do with so many different things. It's not one particular thing. And sometimes that's, that's in itself gets us a little overwhelmed when it's more than one thing that we are, um, that we're praying about. Um, but I am burdened about several things um, in and around my life. And for others, for different circumstances, for things things going on here at church, for things going on in my home, for things going on, uh, you know, in my family, and just different different scenarios, and I just really, really have a heavy burden. And I feel like God is wanting me to pray about some things, and He wants me to do it by faith. And in saying that, that God has just really, I mean, I had to clean up a little bit before I started this devotion because the Lord really just got all over me um, in the, the sanctuary this morning uh, where I just, you know, really, really, he met with me. Um, I was, you know, praying and studying and reading and he just was showing me this and this and this and it was just such an encouragement that it just, it felt overwhelming and just, you know, it made me cry, it made me rejoice um, and, you know, and praying out loud in the sanctuary because nobody is here right now. And what an opportunity for me um, and what a blessing in my life. And Lord, how he, how he shows up in a personal way in our lives. And so that's what he's done for me today. And I hope that I, in some small way that I do what he's done for me and what he's shown me, I hope that I can even give you a portion, a small portion of it. Um, I want to be able to share all of it. I've got, um, I've got notes in front of me. I don't want to leave anything out. I will be using my glasses. I hope it doesn't cost too much of a glare because um, I have to use lights to be able to um, see things. And anyway, let's get started in Hebrews 11. Let's look at verses 11 through 19. And then I want us to look individually at some circumstances for Sarah and then some circumstances for Abraham and how that we might could, they're, they're just really a good example of believing by faith. So let's look here in Hebrews 11, starting with verse number 11. It says, through faith also Sarah herself 
received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Now, let me say this. Um, when, whenever, whenever somebody makes you a promise or you make somebody a promise, that is a very serious thing. I don't make a lot of promises. I try my very best to keep my word. If I say I'm going to be somewhere, if I'm going to do something, I try my very best to do it within my ability. My a promise to say I promise I'll be there, I don't do. Um, to say I promise that I will do something, I don't do. I will do if I'm at all possible. If the circumstances um, are at all possible, I will. You know, I want and I. There's some things that I want to do, and there's some things that I want to promise. But I know in my own ability that sometimes things happen. Um, if I say, I promise you I will be there at 12 o'clock and I get in my car and it doesn't crank, I'm going to break my promise because my car didn't crank. Those circumstances sometimes keep us from keeping a promise. So be very, very, very careful about making a promise. Now, saying that, um, I have been promised some things from a very young child. I think this was something that my real dad had a tendency to say, um, I promise. He had to say, I promise a lot as a child. And even as a young child, you cherish that promise as if nothing can stop it from happening. But this was something that my dad my real dad would say, and, and really looking back and knowing what I know now, not, not knowing this as a child, but knowing what I know now, he had no intentions of keeping his promise. It was just something to say. It was something to make him look good in the moment. It was something to get me to do what he wanted me to do if he made a promise. So be very, very careful about what you promise. Um, I believe God will hold you accountable for those things that you promise. And when you break a promise, it is a serious, serious thing. And so don't make promises that you, especially if you really have no intentions on keeping it. Um, men are terribly bad to do this. Oh, I promise you, honey, I'll, you know, I will rub your feet if you rub my back. You know, or I'll do this or I'll do that. You know, men are really, really bad um, at making promises that really they don't intend on keeping or they don't want to keep um, or, you know, because all they're doing is trying to get you to do something that they want you to do. And so we know that promises um, that many times they're broken. We know that promises sometimes, you know, individuals really, really are just trying to get us to do something that they want us to do. Um, and they make some promises um, that they really don't want to keep. Um, and then we know also um, that many times, especially as a parent, there are things that I want to do um, that, I'm, and that I end up not able to do. Um, and, and that's because circumstances are just outside of our control sometimes. So we need to be aware of that before we make a promise. Um, I say so often now, Lord willing, um, I can meet you there. Lord willing, I can get that done. Lord willing, but so many times things pull me in different directions and I'm not able to do some things or I'm not able to do things exactly when somebody needed me to do them. So sometimes, you know, they have to wait just like most of the time I have to wait on things. So saying all that, we know that a promise is a very valuable thing, but that from a human perspective, we shouldn't make a bunch of promises and we shouldn't put a lot of confidence in promises that others make to us. But when God says it, that's a whole different ballpark. That's a whole different thing. Now, because I was made a lot of promises when I was a child and I just, you know, like I shared um, as a young child, I thought that was, you know, that was, you know, nothing, not changeable, that nothing could be changed, that it was, it was as good as done. And that's what a promise is supposed to be. Um, but saying that, that whenever we, we start looking at God's promises, we almost start treating him like an earthly promise, like it's an earthly promise, like it's an earth, like he's an earthly father. And so I'll say that when I, in my early years of walking with the Lord, that I was, um, I was not so trusting 
that that promise applied to me. Um, not that I thought that he couldn't or wasn't able. I've had this hang up that he didn't want to because of my experience of so many times promises were made to me by somebody who did not want to do them in, to begin with. Um, and so I, you know, I kind of, and you know, I'm not realizing it brought that into my adulthood. And it's, you know, it's only been probably the last 10 years that I finally figured out that, um, that God's not treating me that way. Um, and his promises are sure and they're not changeable. What his, his word is not changeable. It is absolute truth. He cannot lie. We talked about that in Hebrews um, the other day. It was in Hebrews. I've got it wrote down here. Hebrews 6, 18, I think. Um, somewhere here in my notes, I'm looking for it. Hebrews 6, 18. I don't see it, but that's where, that's where it was. And Hebrews 6, 18 said it is impossible for God to lie. It is impossible. So when he makes a promise, no matter what the circumstances look like, no matter how much time has passed, when he makes a promise, it's going to come to pass. And so we're going to look at how these promises that God made to Sarah and to Abraham and how that they did come to pass. They just didn't come to pass how Sarah and Abraham thought they might would. And they came about in God's timing and God's way at the appointed time. At his appointed time, not my appointed time. <laughs> my appointed time would be yesterday or today or right now. I don't, I'm sure you're like that as well. When you ask the Lord for something, you're, you're really wanting it like right now, Lord. But as he grows us, we realize that he's not raising a bunch of brats that we may have to wait. He wants us to be patient. He wants us to wait on him. Those that wait on the Lord, those that wait on the Lord, there's so many times in the scripture where it talks about waiting on the Lord. And what that is saying is that it's worth it. He is worth waiting for. He's worth waiting on. And what he has in store for us is worth waiting on. Now, let's get into the scripture. Verse number 11, through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Now, I want you to look in your, in your scripture. I want you to look in your Bibles. Go back to Genesis chapter number 17. Genesis chapter number 17. It's going to take me a little bit to flip as well. So you, you flip while I flip. I don't. I didn't come and pre-mark all my pages. I knew I did it in my study, but I didn't go back and pre-mark everything. So, um, chapter seventeen of Genesis. Um, I'm looking at number fifteen. It says, "And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her na her name be." And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Now look at 17. And Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born of him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? When I had this lesson for my kids in, in our youth group, and we had just a ball trying to get them to understand the age of which Sarah was, that God has made a promise that he's going to give her a child. Now, these circumstances do not dictate what God is able to do. Circumstances and time does not dictate God's promises. And that is something that is hard to to learn and it's hard to experience because we are so we we're bound to the watch I, I constantly am checking my watch i gave paisley my watch i've got to get me a new one um i'm i'm constantly checking my watch to see how what kind of time frame i'm on i'm constantly looking at the calendar to see what's going on looking ahead at, at dates and and seeing what's going on and i'm i'm bound a lot of times by time and dates god is not God is not. Circumstances do not dictate whether God's promises are going to come to pass. Um, and here we see that he's made this promise that Abraham's going to have a son and it's going to be through Sarah. Who would have thought she's 90 years old and getting made this promise? But God said it and it will come to pass. And we know that it did come to pass. So let's look on. Look on, and so we have, um, go on to chapter number 18, and it says, uh, and look at verse number 9. 
And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? So this is, uh, he, the Lord comes um, in the form of three visitors to Abraham. And so now they're communicating with Abraham. And they say in verse number nine, And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I certainly, re I, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life, according to God's time, according to his time, according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah, thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Now, this is, these are the circumstances. This is what I'm talking about. These are the circumstances. Verse number 11. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age. And it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Now, this is uh, the circumstances are impossible for God's promise to come to pass. It is impossible for a man and a woman at this age to have a child. She has passed the manner of women. She has passed, she has done, went through menopause. She's never been able, she's been barren all these years. She's never been able to have a child. And the Lord has, has said, reaffirmed his promise that she's going to have a child in, in the midst of these circumstances, that they were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. And I want to remind us that circumstances do not dictate God's promises. They do not dictate his promises. They do not, the Lord does not care if the circumstances look like it's all going against you. He does not care if everything, if everyone is against you, if every, if all of the details look like it's just getting worse and worse and worse. And for my situation, the things that, like, there's several things I'm praying about, it all looks like it's getting worse. And as I was getting discouraged about it, as I was getting a really overcome by it, the Lord has given me these scriptures and, the, and wanting me to, to, to please him with my faith, faith that he is going to bring things to pass when it's time in his way. And so circumstances, this doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter what, um, it doesn't matter what the doctor's visit says. It doesn't matter what the blood work says. It doesn't matter what, um, what the court says. It doesn't matter what the evidence is. It doesn't matter who has shunned you. It doesn't matter who has turned their back on you. It doesn't matter when God says, that he's going to bring something to pass, that something's going to happen. It doesn't matter about the circumstances. He's not bound by anything. We are. We are, but he's not. And he wants us to walk with him by faith, not based on what we see. Because if, if we went by what we saw, we would be overcome. If we went by what we saw, we would not believe. But he wants us to believe without seeing because he wants us to believe in what he says. And what he says is always perfect, is always right. Because why? Because Hebrews 6, 18 says, God cannot lie. He cannot lie. I can lie. You can lie. Others can lie to you. Others can lie about you. God cannot lie. And so when he says something, it will come to pass. When he says that he's going to be for you, who can be against you, he will bring it to pass. When he says that he's coming back, that's exactly what he's going to do. He is coming back, and he is coming back right on time at the appointed time. And we know that he, and, and, it, and what we need to know from that is that, are you ready? If he comes back today, are you ready? I'm ready. I know my name is there. I know, I didn't used to know that. I didn't used to, I w didn't used to be confident about that. But now, uh, and my confidence is not in me. All my hope is in Jesus. Every single part of it. All my hope is in Jesus. I know that if Jesus comes back today, that I'm ready and I will be taken into heaven and join him in the air. I know that I'm going to heaven. Um, so there's some promises that here that we see. And then it, that it's, that it's nothing. Is to, if you look in verse number 14 in chapter 18 and verse number 14, it says, Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah shall have a son. Now, I want you to look at 
chapter 21. Chapter 21, and the Lord visited Sarah. Verse number one, chapter 21, and the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, as he had said, when it was time he was coming back, when it's, when it's time he is coming back, the Lord Jesus is coming back the second time, just like he said. And here in this instance, the Lord said, I'm going to be back and when I return, she's going to have a child. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. And for Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. When it was time, God brought it to pass. Now, when God did that in those insurmountable circumstances and there was no way for this to happen through circumstances that that left it merely impossible but with God nothing is impossible nothing is too hard for God this did some things in the life of Abraham and Sarah this really really did some things and we're going to see that going back to Hebrews keep your um you know you can keep your place marked in Genesis um because we'll be back here in a moment but back here in the chapter 11 of Hebrews and looking at verse number 12, therefore sprang there even of one uh, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude and, of, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. So this is the, his offspring, the, their son, whose name was Isaac, was going to have so many offspring that it was not going to be numbered. His, his offspring is still going on. It's still not, it is, and it cannot be numbered. It says it compares it to the stars and to the sand of the sea. Verse number 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that said such things declare plainly that they seek a country and truly, if they had been minded of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is a heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. By faith, here's where I want to get to, verse number 17, by faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son now he not only was told that he was going to have a son he was also told that this son this particular son not another son abraham had other children not another son this particular son was going to be multiplied to so many in number that they were not going to be able to be counted that is still being multiplied today um and so looking here at uh, Abraham says, uh, the, the, what said about Abraham, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. Now, I want you to go back to the book of Genesis and look at ver in chapter number 22. Genesis chapter number 22, verse number one. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Now, does that make any sense to you? That doesn't make any sense, does it? But Abraham, because he believed God, and because God was found faithful and giving him a son, not just giving him a son, but giving him a son through his wife, Sarah, when she was much, well past age, well past able, well past the manner of women, well stricken in years, he gave them a child. And then he said, and he's going to have descendants that are just going to go on and on and on and on, and you're not going to be able to number them. You're not even going to be able to number them. Now, this coming from a man who thought he wasn't going to ever have any children, thought that his lineage was going to stop right there with him, and God's saying, no, that's not what I've chosen. I've chosen to take you and to multiply from you, from your seed, and I've also chosen to do it from Sarah. So he had chosen now, you know, they had thought God was being late and they tried to do it another way. I mean, we won't get into all that, but God said, no, it was going to be through Abraham and through Sarah. So now God's saying, 
Take your only son and offer him as a burnt offering on Mount Moriah. And, you know, what did Abraham think? He, he, he was acting out of faith. That's what he was doing. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to act through faith. By faith are you saved. He wants us to, to please him. How do we please him? By faith. By faith. It's impossible to please the Lord without it. We just shared that yesterday. Verse number three, and Abraham uh, Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled him. He did it immediately. He rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went into the place in which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again unto you. Do you realize what he's saying? He is. He knows. Nobody else knows. He knows he's going up there to give his son, uh, offer up his son. What does that mean? He means he's going to kill him on the offering, offer him up a, as a burnt offering. But what does he say? He says, um, verse number five, and come again to you. I and, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. I believe that he was confident that he's going to take Isaac up there and he was going to offer him as a burnt offering, but that God was must be going to bring him back to life because he knows what God said. And God cannot lie and God has proved himself faithful to Abraham and God um, has, has told him to do this. So God must be... He must be going to bring him back to life and me and the lad are going to come back. We're going to be back. Just stay here because me and the lad are going to be back. We're going to be back. And Abraham took the uh, wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son and took the fire in his hand and a knife and they went both of them together and Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Do you get that? God will provide himself. God himself was the lamb that was slain. God himself. Jesus is God. Some people don't get that. Some people don't understand that. Jesus is God. He's God in flesh. God being had to come and be man because man is the one who sinned and God had to be man for me and for you. And he was the lamb. God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together and they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. He's not fighting off Abraham. He willingly is doing what his father has asked. I'm sure that it wasn't making good sense to him, but he trusted his father. That's the whole point, is for us to trust our heavenly father. We have to trust him. We have to trust him that he knows what he's doing. And Abraham, verse number 10, stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him in a ram, uh, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh, as is, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. Circumstances do not dictate what God has said. Circumstances have no relevance to the Lord. They do to us. We look we, because we have to deal with them. We're looking at them, but we believe by faith, not by sight, not by what we see, not by what's going on around us. Not by what we have in our head, not by the, the, the oppression that's around us, the oppression that's maybe within us, the oppression of others, not about any of that. But we believe by faith what God has said. He's coming back. Are you ready? Maybe you think, well, I've done too much. 
Um, there's, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've done either. And God saved me. And if he was save, save me and I know what I've done, you don't. I know what I've done. I know what's in my past. I know what God had to save me from. And he will save anybody. Romans, if you go to the book, go to the book of Romans, chapter number 10. Go to the book of Romans, chapter number 10, looking at verse number 9. Um, through verse number 13, Romans chapter number 10, verses 9 through 13, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Not space, it's not based on circumstances. It's not, it's not about what you've done. It's not about what's been done. It's not about any of those things. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart, that's faith. Believe in thine heart about things that you haven't seen. But because God said it, you know it to be true and you believe it by faith. And shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Doesn't matter what your background is. Doesn't matter if you were Jew or Greek or Chinese, Japanese, Russian, Hispanic, Italian. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter were you know american it doesn't matter it's for everyone it is for absolutely for everyone verse number 13 says for whosoever i'm a whosoever you're a whosoever for whosoever shall call upon the name of the lord shall be saved that is his promise that is his promise to you he promised me that he would save me and when I asked him, when I confessed my sins to him and I cried out to him, he absolutely was faithful and he saved me. I did not deserve it. I did not earn it. I had not merited it in any way. It wasn't because I was a church member or I had been baptized because I was lost after I got baptized. It wasn't even that my husband was a preacher. My husband had got called to preach in May. I didn't get saved till it was until July of that year. My husband was a preacher, and I just about put my faith and trust, in, you know, in in that he had been called to preach. My faith was in his calling. I thought, well, if he was called to preach, then the Lord, I must be okay because God wouldn't have done that. But my circumstances didn't dictate anything about that. He was faithful to save me in spite of the wrong thinking that I had in spite of the mistakes that I had made, in spite of everything. He was faithful and just, just, and he saved me just like he said he would, just like he told Sarah, just like he told Abraham. When he said, just as he had said, he came back just as he had said. He's coming back just as he has already said. He's coming back. I want us to flip um, on that notion. I want us to flip to John chapter 14. Go to the book of John chapter 14. Um, in verse number three, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Jesus, this is red letter. This is Jesus. He's saying he's going to go somewhere. He's got some things to prepare for us. He's preparing for us a mansion. He's, but he says, I will come again. Oh my goodness. I get so much comfort from that, that he is coming back. And then it scares me for those that are not ready. Are you ready? Because he's coming back. I'm ready. I hope you are. He's coming back. He says, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. That means that we get to go to heaven with him. He's coming back to pick us up. We're going to meet him in the air. If he comes back before we see the grave, He's gonna. we're going to come back and meet him in the air. And he's coming back soon. No matter what the circumstances are, no matter how many years it's been, Remember Abraham and Sarah? They were well stricken in years. It was way long time past that. God made a promise back in Genesis. Go to Genesis. Go back to Genesis, but look at chapter number three. Go to Genesis chapter number three. This is about his first coming. Genesis chapter number three and verse 15. This is where he um, we first see the promise of Jesus. 
and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So this is the seed that God promised. This is the seed spoken of in, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Did not happen for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. But when it came time, flip over into the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah chapter number 7. The book of Isaiah chapter number 7. And look at number verse number 14, and it says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a son. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Verse, uh, go flip over to chapter 9, verse number 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He still hadn't came yet. This is years and years and years and years later after Genesis 3.15. He still hasn't came yet. God's still talking about him. He's still reminding others of, of that seed that's to come. Now, flip over to Luke chapter number 2. When you think about Christmas, um, and uh, we always go to Luke chapter 2, go to, go to Luke chapter 2, and look at verse number 11. Let me get flipped there myself. Luke 2, chapter, chapter 2, verse number 11, it says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. He made a promise. He promised back in Genesis 3.15. Time had no bearing on that promise. He knew exactly when it would be the right time. Hundreds and hundreds of years later, then it's time for Jesus to come. And here we read about that, that coming in, in Luke chapter 2, verse number 11. It was time. It was the appointed time. And then we know that he's coming back, and he'll come back right on time. And it has been hundreds and hundreds of years, and it's any time is the right time. And um, when we think about God's promises and that he's coming back and we want to be ready, and that while we're here, that while we're waiting, he's made us some promises in our present circumstances that have nothing to do, um, you know, they have nothing to do with whether God is able or God is willing because there's nothing that's too hard for the Lord. No matter what your circumstances are, you know, even if you are saved and you have, you have eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, but you have in your years of, of being saved, you've messed up. I have done that. I have made some horrible mistakes. Even while, even during, you know, since I've been saved, I've made some horrible mistakes. But you know what? I found out that God had made me a promise that if I come to him and I confess my sin, he is faithful and just to forgive me of my sins. Look at 1 John chapter 1, verse number 9. 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 9. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. No matter what you've done, um, even as a Christian, we are still going to mess up. No matter what the circumstances were, we are still going to mess up. Have you asked God to forgive you? Have you asked him to cleanse you? Because that's all you have to do. He promises that he'll forgive you. He promises to clean you. He, you've not, he's not going to put you up on the shelf. He's going to continue to use you, but you need to confess it to him. I had to confess it to him that, man, I had a bad attitude for a long time. I was bitter and I was angry, and I needed to ask the God, God to forgive me, and that's exactly what he did, and he started healing my broken heart. He started helping me deal with those things that I was bitter about and um, in showing me things that I can do whenever somebody would hurt me, he would say, bless them. And I would turn around and, and speak kind things to them, do kind, kind things for them. And God changed my heart. He changed my heart. I'm not angry and I'm not bitter. And I love the Lord. And your circumstances, um, they don't dictate what God has planned for you. Don't look at your circumstances. Look to God. Because he's made some promises and he is faithful and just to keep those promises no matter what it looks like. Thank you for joining me. I look forward to seeing you again soon.